Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining. I'm Kellen Betts, a course lead in the MITx MicroMasters program in supply chain management here at the MIT Center for Transportation Logistics. I'm co-hosting this live event with Laura Aleya, also a course lead in the Micro MicroMasters program. Today, we're very fortunate, very excited to have Maggie Aquino joining us today. Maggie is an e-commerce and supply chain executive for the retail and commerce or consumer food industry in Brazil. She's also alumna of the MIT GC Log program. Welcome, Maggie. Hi, thank you for having me. Very happy to be here. Awesome. So, Lara, the floor is yours to share the agenda for today's session. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. And thank you, Maggie, for joining us today. So, to everyone in the audience, during the next 10, 15 minutes, Maggie will present on the importance of investing in fulfillment technologies. And of course, also about business strategies that are needed to meet evolving needs of our shoppers. But then of course, we will have a few initial questions on this topic to kick it off. Um, but after that, we will really want to bring your questions to our table for Maggie. So we will definitely save time for those at the end. Please start thinking on those and remember that you need to use the Q&A feature to ask the questions. And of course, be sure to be logged in with a name um, because we will not read it if it says that it comes from an anonymous user. With that in mind, I think Maggie, we're ready to go. Um, kick it off. Thank you. So I'll share here my screen. And not only my screen, but my experience uh, through these years. Uh, just a sec. All set. So the idea today, it's uh, before uh, present my experience and uh, speak a little about my about me. I'm Argentinian. I live in Brazil for the last eight years. I am a former uh, MIT student. I did GC log uh, in 2020, and I have been studying supply chain management for the last 14 years in different institutions across Americas. I also have a business experience. I worked for Avon Unilever. Uh, Group of BG, former Walmart in Brazil, and latest um, Carrefour, uh, French retailer. So my experience it's on lately how to serve customers through digital channels, and what I've learned in the academic side helped me a lot to build strategies to serve customers. So this is a little bit what I want to share with you, but before everything. Uh, before jumping into network design or technology, first we have to think about our customers, uh, about our consumers, and most impo importantly, when we are uh, talking about uh, consumers, is the one who shops. So for groceries, uh, we have seen an evolving consumer that have different buying missions. We're talking about, for example, uh, urgency, uh, opportunity missions, buying uh, offers, uh, replenishment, and plant purchases. So for every behavior, we saw here in Latin America a shift since 2020, where e-commerce was not so uh, present for groceries especially. And the COVID-19 made us uh, consumers change our behavior. And because of that, retailers, e-retailers and brick and mortars, we had to redesign the way we were uh, working on digital channels. So um, that was an experience uh, that we used to configure our network, uh, our stores, DCs and so on. But first, and nowadays, nowadays after five years of this big switch, uh, understand better what the customer wants, which is speed, transparency, and consistency. And based on that, define the strategies that we actually need to serve uh, our customers. So, um, of course, it's very different to work with e-commerce in big cities and small cities, but I have the experience to serve 95% of Brazilian territory in the last two years. I can tell you that uh, the same strategy doesn't fit all and that you really need to understand your customer in order to serve better. 
and in order to be efficient. So uh, what is ship from store? Maybe you are in a different country and you say, hey, well, that was relevant in my country like 10 years ago. Today, I have another configuration. But here in Latin America, ship from store, uh, it's the first big step we did in terms of delivering customers. So basically, we use stores, um, food stores, brick and mortars. We uh, have this, we consider this stock that we have in this store and its location. And we serve about 10 kilometers around our customers from 15 minutes to two days. So we have very uh, different ways of our customers and average uh, our customers buy to be served in two hours at least. So we have many digital channels. So ship from store actually it's to use our stores as uh, hubs, not only to deliver, but to receive our customers for them to pick up in store. And we serve even fresh and frozen foods, not only dry foods. Um, so from the theoretical perspective, we should understand where our customers are, density, costs, uh, and of course, optimize this. This is what we learned at MIT, right? Uh, but what, how does it work when, we, when you don't have the data? When you have the entire hub, the entire network, about 500 to 1,000 stores, how are you going to decide which sales channel to work with and which stores to open. So um, I will share a little bit about this in the upcoming slide, but uh, the most important things that we have to consider in Latin America when designing a network strategy and its optimization, it's the tax complexity, which is different from state to state in Brazil. So that will help you to define if you're going to actually use the ship from store uh, operation or uh, use a distribution center because if you send from one state to another you're going to be impacted by taxes and this is a very complex topic that it's uh, a huge deal here in Brazil uh, the consumer behavior changes because um, we have many players in Latin America you all might know that uh, the big ones are in in Brazil so they have been uh, improving uh, their services and changing the customer expectations. So if you say someone that is going to receive in 10 days, it's like, I'm not going, not going to wait for you. I'm going to switch uh, to other seller, for example. And a huge point here, again, it's the logistic cost. This is an element that needs to be very taking into consideration, maybe you are thinking, okay, yeah, transportation, not only transportation, but packaging. Here in Latin America, especially in Brazil, certain um, groceries amps uh, set an expectation on packaging that is very high. So you need to think about uh, cold chain and uh, materials and costs and even reverse logistics. So this is a point very, very important to be taken into consideration and to work with the industry. And the last point that is uh, the special season here, it's uncertainty because most of the retailers don't know how to work well with e-commerce, with ship from the store. They're giving the baby steps. Uh, some others have a bold experience right now and have been working with e-commerce for the last 10 years, but yet uh, it's very important to understand, for example, if a new Chinese player is entering into the country and it's setting a different game um, elements into serving our customers, uh, you must be prepared to work and deal with uncertainty. So, Going to a specific case, uh, why ship from store is so relevant uh, to deliver groceries in Brazil? First of all, I 
share that uh, customers need to um, understand better. Sorry, I'm just trying to move something here. Uh, our customers in Brazil, they ask for fresh food. So we have less than three hours to work with uh, frozen and fresh items like meat, uh, uh, fresh fruits, and so on. For example, banana is the most uh, ordered item. And because of the different temperatures that we deal here in the country and the high logistics costs, we need to deliver quickly in order to reduce costs and serve the kind of uh, orders that our customers want. So having many retailers with a huge uh, retail complexity, more than 500, 100 stores, and actually needing to increase their sales and start to build this omni-channel strategy, ship from the store first is the easiest way, the cheapest way to enter into e-commerce and omni-channel strategy because you actually already have uh, the people that you need to work with, the store operators, the structure, because it's easy to plug into the software and systems that we have at the store. Uh, you already have the stock and being um, uh, served by DCs. So, and last but not least, we have a huge diversity of last mile here, uh, here that can help with the with the delivery. So, uh, this is something that has been growing. Uh, just for you to have a, a an example, uh, digital commerce. Uh, for groceries, it's about 10% in the US for the la latest Atlantico report in 2023. And in Latin America, we're reaching uh, five to 7%. So we still have a gap. We still have room, room to grow. And that's the way we go. Of course, uh, at the beginning, have, we didn't have the idea where to open this sales digital channel across the stores. So we opened everything. We did everything because we didn't have the data when we have the density for customers to better serve. So we did like the opposite way. We didn't optimize at the beginning. We just opened everything. And every six months, we should double check if we actually, we really needed to maintain uh, certain stores open because of cannibalization or even cost or even to understand not only if one store is going to serve or not, but which sales digital channel they're going to serve or not. And we're going to be a very huge point here. We have two different kinds of operations. The one that we run from the beginning to an end. So we own from the um, site app, the entire customer journey until we deliver into our uh, shopper's home. And the other one that is that we, we don't own the app, we're just a seller. Then I received and processed this order and I uh, hand over it back to my to another player to do the last my delivery. So these two different ways to operate uh, are the most uh, complex to balance for region to region from store to store. Uh, so. This is how uh, we overcome the challenge on having data at the beginning. The result, we have evolved in three different uh, moments in the last four years uh, where have, I've been working um, on reducing and aligning the digital strategy with actually the entire uh, format, hypermarket, supermarkets, strategy. So this is not something that uh, the digital team decides on its own. It's a negotiation with the real business that understands that it's an omni-channel strategy. So um, before I move, 
we know that, of course, we need um, technology. We need technology to run this. But b before we talk about technology, I want to talk about people. It's people that need to be aware, trained, and keep up with the pace of the technology changes. So we are talking about maybe 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people that works in different points across the country that needs to understand which is the strategy, which is the process. So please think about technology, not only to work with the process, but to learn, to teach the process. It's very important. So uh, there are many solutions uh, in Latin America, globally. Uh, I had the chance to visit different retailers from the US to Argentina in many countries. And I've seen two uh, diff big differences uh, regarding to technology. The first one, the ones that decided to build their own technology. An example of this is Walmart. Uh, not only just using for themselves, but of course uh, offering as a service for other retailers. So this is a way to go. And there are certain platforms that actually offer this fulfillment technology for stores as a service. And depending on the service, they can also offer the TMS and WMS and many other options. So make or buy, this is the big question. It depends, of course, first, on the investment that each retailer can uh, afford. The second point is uh, the size of the bet on the digital channel. And the third point is the tech stack each retailer has because those systems need to be connected with the entire company. So this is a huge investment as well. Certain uh, last milers, they offer the in-store fulfillment app and platform. So what I see here is that we have like uh, retailers that they, they use 100% what their last mile last milers are offering uh, because they only want to be present in the platform and say the offers, the replenishment mission, uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. Others want to combine into having their own software, but at the time that they are developing, just use another uh, last miler to grow and, and have a better um, volume, sales volume and, and coverage. And others are just want to have full control on the entire operations and plug everything into the same uh, fulfillment software. So it's not only that we have the challenge on online and digital. When you zoom in into the digital channel, you can have up to six, seven different sales channels. And the challenge is not only to manage the orders, it's the timing of these orders because you can have at the same store delivering from 15 minutes to 40 minutes to two days to one week. So the prioritization and optimization of this path, it's still something that needs to be addressed. Um, as I mentioned, uh, don't forget about the last mile delivery, stock management software and training platforms, because actually, these are the softwares that are going to bring uh, the consistency that your e-commerce strategy, e strategy and operations need. Practical thing uh, tips to choose the right technology for your business. First, understand uh, where you're going to run your operations. The access to internet. Then the capital expenditure that you will have to invest in hardware because um, sometimes certain technologies are too heavy for the investment that you have. And for example, we were running 
uh, with the operation is with cell phones, smartphones. That's all. Uh, and you don't need to invest huge amounts of money on devices that looks more like distribution centers. And I'm talking this for small retailers, medium-sized retailers, and even big retailers. So this is something that is sometimes uh, not taken into consideration. It makes total sense because you have you can have a great technology, but then you can run because you don't have the internet. So this is something that needs to be uh, very clear for the moment that you are deciding to choose from a technology. The second point is where it's your technical team based and how they're going to talk with the developers. Because yes, these softwares, they still need a lot of um, configurations and adaptations for this ship from store model. It's an evolving um, way of uh, operate. So you need to have the technical people speaking, fortunately, in the same language and understanding the complexities on the network design and uh, sales channels prioritization. Uh, key takeaways, and then we can go to the questions. It's very important uh, to invest in fulfillment technologies, but think about meeting the expectations and needs of your shoppers. It's very different to invest in a technology that's going to serve your customers in 40 minutes. Uh, and it's very different to serve them in two days, three days, or even uh, a month, okay? Um, it's more than important to have all the involvees in the same conversation mostly when we talk about transportation and stock management, because this is just the beginning of the entire process, of the entire chain. And technology, it's something that needs to be connected for each stage of the process, and most important, the data. And from the professional perspective, I must say that knowledge is key for uncertain scenarios. And I'm saying five years ago, I didn't have the data to say, we are going to bet in this expansion in this region. But I knew how we could configure the different elements of our network uh, design, because I've started that before. I did, for example, my capstone at MIT uh, for a food retailer. So even uh, having not clear the data to make the decision, I can understand how other uh, process uh, works in the past to take the decisions. And then to have like the proof of concept uh, good enough to even start to optimize later. Last but not least, it's important to have a clear business strategy. Otherwise, we're going to build a huge operation, uh, very complex, and then you're not serving your customer. And what happens at that time? You put everything back and start from the beginning. And that this is a huge cost. I've seen many strategies like opening uh, dark stores and then having closed uh, or trying from one side to another uh, where to base it operations or even the partnerships. Uh, so that's very important to understand who you're serving, how, and when you are pursuing uh, your financials and your um, rentability objectives, okay? So these are the key takeaways and happy to receive some questions. Awesome. Well, thank you, Maggie. This this topic is very fascinating to me. I, a few years ago, worked for a retailer that was in the middle of launching buy online pickup in store, and they had just kind of recently launched ship from store. So a lot of these memories, the challenges and the trade-offs, but also the opportunity with ship from store are definitely kind of fresh in my mind, if you will. Um, so definitely <laughs> a fascinating topic. I also found it fascinating that you said that banana is the most 
frequently purchased item. We always see that here in the U.S. So that's the most frequently purchased grocery item as well. So it seems like it's more universal than I would anticipate maybe. Um, so maybe just kind of a first question, just kind of like a trends or future trends question. You know, one of the challenges that my experience, at least from ship from store, is just that cost of in-store fulfillment, you know, that pick and pack operation. A store is not really designed for that. It's really more designed for that in-store customer experience, you know, whereas a warehouse, you design it for like that pick and pack efficiency, if you will. Um, at the same time, you have the significant advantage of the store, as you mentioned multiple times, where the proximity to the customer, you have your existing brick and mortar network, which you, just, you don't have to build a new facility, you know, you can leverage your existing network. Um, so some of the trends that I've seen to kind of address this balance, if you will, you know, the cost of the, in, or the efficiency of the in-store fulfillment versus the opportunity of the proximity and those kinds of things are some things like micro fulfillment centers or where some of the stores, like they're redesigning their back room for like more efficient uh, fulfillment, or even you mentioned dark stores. Um, I know you, you mentioned that ship from stores kind of newer to Latin America. Are you seeing some of these other trends in Latin America as well, like micro fulfillment centers? Well, um, I have a few words in, in different topics. So I'll start from what I see now that it's happening. The first thing is after uh, four or five years on, on working in this industry, I see that force retailers have grown their coverage and sales. So now that um, we have like more density, it's time to start thinking on change in layout, uh, outsourcing operations, and even, for example, moving those operations to a distribution center. So now, and the upcoming two years, I foresee in Latin America, uh, really necessity on running a network design uh, study. Because now we have data. Now we understand where to serve better and the higher cost. And we are going through up tax changes uh, in this country. So this is something I, I really see uh, happening right now. The second point is you mentioned, for example, okay, certain retailers are working to from store, are they redesigning their uh, back rooms? Well, first point here in Latin America, you'll see a front room. It's not in the back, it's in the front, mostly because the um, we serve up, in up to two hours and going from one point to another in the store, it takes a lot of time. So uh, what you will see this, this in here in Brazil, the stores that uh, work with e-commerce is that the operations run uh, at the beginning of the store, very close to, to the door. And it's very hard, yes, to run these operations in places that are not uh, optimized for e-commerce uh, like distribution centers. For example, when you go into store, we want you to be there, to spend a lot of time. And that's why, for example, you have certain categories at the beginning and what you really need at the end. So you can walk every, everywhere. And you know, a fun fact regarding this, it's at the operator, that the picker, they have to do this entire uh, path to get the items. So you can even use technology to optimize this path. But the, on my experience in the last years, it's that operators uh, really follows their own knowledge and experience. They have the entire path optimized, uh, but say, I really prefer to do the way that I know. The only thing I really know is I have to pick the fresh and, and for example, uh, ice item at the end, frozen item at the end. So um, it's not only the structure, but the team that you have in the store, it's very different from what you run in a distribution center. About trends, I see the industry direct to consumer, they start to build its own path. Uh, because of course they see that they are going well on the digital sales channel from the retailers. And it's like, okay, why I'm not doing this? 
So this is a huge question that I've been discussing with colleagues here. Uh, I'm talking about cosmetics industry, food industry, uh, many others, not only from food. Um, but the point is how to build your network, how to start to operate. Uh, and what I mentioned at the beginning, it's a different moment and a different network configuration. So I foresee in the next two years, at least in Brazil, we're going to have like more clear understanding on who wants to be to owning the channel, who's going to operate and who's going to deliver. Uh, but this is going to be more and more and more complex. Thank you, Maggie. I love the fact that you mentioned like sometimes speaker knows what works better, at least for them or for a certain specific store or a certain specific warehouse. And I love this thinking process of maybe we can improve the way you, like we created our model to incorporate some other aspects that probably this person is actually bringing or identify why is the person thinking something could work best so that we uh, adjust it in a certain way that works for everyone. So I, I, I love that you bring the people factor in. Um, I'm thinking also in this, you brought a little bit of the technology, but also about the complexity. Um, I'm wondering about AI. You know, everyone is talking about artificial intelligence right now. And I wonder how have you seen it integrated, if it's already integrated or it's a working process into this landscape? Um, what are the specific applications that you can see or that you foresee? It could uh, enhance efficiency, improve uh, the customer experience, optimize supply chain operations. I personally have heard about dynamic pricing. I have heard about the algorithms to offer uh, um, like supplemental products when you're making a certain purchase. So I'm very curious to know if it, it is actually being implemented and, and how do you foresee that making our lives as a consumer different in the future? Yeah, so I'm going to bring uh, different examples that maybe are not very known. Uh, the first one, remember that I mentioned that the customer seeks for consistency. So if I order something, I want to get delivered the time in full, okay? So AI, it's being used to suggest in the moment that you are doing your uh, your shopping cart, uh, just to suggest in case this product is not available, a potential out of stock, then which uh, suggestions or which uh, different product could I send it back to you? So uh, substitutions that we call here in Brazil, uh, it's a huge topic that offends customer experience and even replenishment and um, how we deal with out of stock. So in that aspect, I've seen three different AI applications. The first one, of course, understanding data and setting intelligence artificial models for um, fresh food, for actually fruits, for example. So we can really understand the different uh, volume and time to uh, replenish this at the store to then deliver the right way to across channels. The second point is when the operator, uh, they just uh, understand at the shelf that I miss that I'm item is missing so we have an out of stock for a certain product they have to think so we wanted to take that uh, action from him and simplify uh, their life so ai it's being used to in in case something's missing then you should suggest this to our customer or even though to anticipate and have this stock levels reading, understanding at different levels. And before the operator starts, starts their, their picking journey, suggest the customer a different product. Of course, we need to solve the problem at the source. 
having a good, um, you know, stock management uh, levels and software. But in the meanwhile, we need to serve customers. We need this in order to grow. Uh, and the third point, as you mentioned, it's dynamic pricing. Um, it's more related to uh, get this uh, consumer into the right timing and offers. But the point is, from my, what I see, we are investing too much and it's good on having the customer uh, buying, but we need to invest more on delivering what we promise to the customers in order to have a sustainable operations that grows across the future. Awesome, thank you. Those sound like um, fascinating projects, especially the one where you're recommending like an alternative. You know, I've seen that as just as a consumer experiencing that where you get a text message saying, this is out of stock, but we could suggest this particular item. So that's a fascinating opportunity there for AI to improve that suggestion there. I mean, you know, kind of building on that, I have kind of a question on one of the other challenging, uh, I guess, decisions that's made in this omni-channel you know, order history, if you will, you know, the flow from, you know, checkout to delivery at the home step. One of the challenging decisions may not be as relevant maybe for grocery, but especially for other type of retailers is the assignment, assignment of where you ship from, right? So if you have many different stores, like let's say you're in a city and you have, you know, several different stores in that city, which store you actually deliver that order from can be a challenging decision to make in real time from a software perspective. Um, you know, you have to take into a lot of, account a lot of variables like proximity and stock availability and all kinds of things. And so I'm wondering like what your experience is with that particular um, decision point um, from a technology or from a, you know, operations perspective. Well, um, when I started uh, in, in this segment, I really have in mind that, yes, we need to optimize based on the stocks and proximity and so on. So uh, like a very um, conceptual thinking. But then when you go into the reality, uh, depending on the tech stack that you have, for example, you know your site, if you your company didn't develop the, your entire site and it's using a third party, you will perceive that you have restrictions on where you can deliver. So for example, you have two stores and a delivery area they can't uh, be the same, uh, like the same point can't be served because uh, of the technology for two stores. So you as a customer, you don't have the chance to choose depending on your e-commerce platform where we're going to be served. So the idea, it's far from reality. And that's what I mentioned at the beginning that your business strategy needs to be uh, aligned then with your technology. Because from my experience, it's like, okay, I wanted to serve a customer from where I really have uh, idle capacity. Maybe it's a store that it's two kilometers away. But the point is I have this customer assigned with the store, which is uh, one kilometer away and that it's full of capacity, I can't do anything else. And we were uh, working on having a different like manual assignment to move one order from to other store. So we still have a lot of complexity regarding optimizing uh, cost to serve and even speed experience or even working better with adult capacity because of um, technology restrictions that of course those are uh, on the path to be solved but it's um, you know sometimes it's like I know we could do this and we are not doing just because of that it's not an issue yet but it's a, like a tech constraint and that for example should be considered into uh, running your uh, optimization model which tech uh, platform are you using in order to actually deliver. Otherwise, um, it's not practical. 
Thank you, Maggie. It's it's insightful so far. And we have so many questions that I don't think we're going to get to answer all of them. But even though that, please keep them coming because we're going to share the questions with Maggie just so that uh, she can uh, go back to us in a different way in the future. Um, so before we transition to the questions for the audience in the interest of time, um, I wanted to share with you that most of the audience here is part of the MicroMasters in SEM program or maybe it's an SEM expert or someone shaping their path or willing to switch to SEM at some point and are exploring this. So you're an expert in this field. You're also a GCLog alumna, which makes you part of our amazing and outstanding MIT community that we love. Um, what would be your advice or your recommendation to that person who is shaping their path in supply chains trying to get into the e-commerce world, for example, that you're into. Um, anything you want to share for them today? Sure. Well, first, it's just to jump and, and do it. Um, there's a lot of content uh, available. And of course, uh, having and uh, being connected with people that work with e-commerce and supply chain, it's key. So. From my personal experience, uh, joining MIT was was um, a game changer. I really I was working with uh, industry consumer goods CPG and I wanted to move to e-commerce. So understanding better um, a few things that I, I've learned uh, allowed me to move in that direction. But the point is then having practical experience, it's also important. And as I say to my mentees and, and team, you can even work with e-commerce if you want to. It's just simple. You can start being a seller in any platform and really understand your challenge by yourself <laughs> in a practical way, starting with uh, buying items, reselling, for example, and applying your knowledge uh, or even become a shopper, you know, the different platforms for a day. So this is something that you could do uh, without actually starting a certain role at company. And when you are talking or understanding better the business, having this practical experience without uh, many compromises, it's great. It's great. So that's my suggestion. And again, if anyone us to, to have a word on this, very happy to do it, do it not only in English, but in Spanish and Portuguese. Awesome. Well, thank you. That's great advice um, for our, our MicroMasters and other learners out there who are in their career journey. Um, and we do have tons of questions in the Q&A, so thank you for all of those. Um, and thank you, everyone, for you know logging in with your, your name there and keep them coming. We will share um, the questions with Maggie at the end. So maybe just to kind of jump in um, to the, some of the first questions here, one that stuck out to me, which seems like a, you know, not coming from grocery, coming from like a different area of retail, um, seems like could it would be a significant challenge for grocery, especially is just the swings in demand, like regular retail, you know, you have the peak season with holiday and that kind of thing. But with grocery, it seems like the dynamics of demand would be really complex. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to how that challenges the um, this this conversation, you know, just like the day of the week swings in demand um, with grocery. We have like two different kind of behaviors. The ones that are uh, special events, like for example, Easter, uh, Mother's Day. Uh, and in December, well, we have of course Black Friday, but uh, going to certain events is not like very usual. Uh, the um, payment of the final uh, salary here in Brazil in December before Christmas. It's crazy. So, uh, and then of course, uh, during the week, delivering Monday's morning and Friday, Saturday are the best dates. Uh, and it's way more expressive than other days but not only that for example the, depending the time of the day early in the morning for a certain group of customers or bef uh, before lunch right after before lunch 
or by the end of the day. So it's like when people eat home. Uh, and this has switched a lot from 2020, where everyone was at home uh, for this year. And for example, here in Brazil, most of the companies are going back to hybrid models uh, way of work. So you're not at home, you can receive your groceries, and then you switch for other days and hours. So we can see this every time. Um, of course, there are certain uh, products that depends on the temperature. Uh, for example, it's too hot and ice cream start to boom. Uh, but sometimes we understand that it's uh, kind of risky to deliver those products. So we remove those items uh, from certain delivery modes or certain regions because we cannot ensure um, that the product is going to be delivered as they should. Um, so like many different uh, details and uh, insights that you can get from reading your data and it's very dynamic. So for example, I used to work with demand planning and we would use uh, two years history and for innovations only six months. You know, using six months, uh, it's like a, it's interesting, but sometimes you need to uh, use the data from the last three months because in a certain region, something changed and then you discover in the, there's a new competitor or a new certain product or something that changed. So you need to uh, ask data for new insights and these demand peaks may vary uh, from region to region and across years. Thank you, Maggie. And, and a little bit connected to that, we have some questions on reverse logistics. So if demand is fluctuating a lot and it varies from region to region, um, usually the reverse logistics like returns are a, a much higher level of, of uncertainty for all companies. I'm wondering if you had to deal uh, with that uh, part of the network design with the reverse logistic portion, or what are the challenges that you observe in terms of the different kind of products that you have because you have perishable items and you have fresh produce. Um, so I wonder if, if there are any insights you wanna share about the, the reverse logistics portion. Yeah, so benefits on having uh, like a hybrid uh, network uh, is that we can use the stores for reverse logistics. So the customer, they go back to the store, any store, Maybe it's not the store from uh, it was the order was served uh, and they change, for example, because of the expiration date or because uh, the customer can make a mistake when buying. For example, I wanted this product, but now I want a light uh, version or diet version. So please change it for me. Or uh, I, I bought a lot of these, but the expiration date um, is not what I expected because I went a longer time. So that happened a lot at the store. Uh, other customers, they connect with our customer service attendants and reverse logistics for uh, low tickets is very hard to do. So depending on the case, uh, we just send back a coupon or something and just you can keep with the products. Uh, but of course we double check this is not uh, misbehave of our consumers and we understand across time if that actually it's an issue or, or not and the second point is to um, delivering with certain partners what the customer needs for example uh someone bought uh product for a barbecue here in brazil which is a churrasco and they perceive at the moment that they receive that the shohasco is missing. It was out of stock or not the temperature or something happened. So we were working with, uh, not with our own structure, but with last milers just to this team to have autonomy and to send the product that was missing in less than 30 minutes to our customer. So this is something very interesting that you can, uh, when you can't reverse that logistic to serve in another way. Reverse logistics for non-food, it's still a challenge. 
Um, and you don't have much density uh, asking, I mean, there are not many customers asking for reverse logistics. It's different from example, from the fashion industry and, and fashion delivery. So um, it's, there's, there's room, there's a challenge here. Uh, and for sure, uh, not only that will serve better customers, but will serve better um, uh, financials. So it, it's very hard and very costly uh, not having reverse logistics. Awesome. Well, thank you. The reverse logistics I think, is a challenge for a lot of retailers, even for non-perishable items. I imagine for perishable items, it's even more challenging for sure. So. Um, and maybe kind of building on that concept, you know, I know reversal logistics is kind of in this space of maybe like reducing waste and circularity and sustainability, if you will. And there's a question here from um, Ali Zade. Um, apologize if I pronounce your name incorrectly there, but um, could just I know for some retailers, sustainability is kind of a big part of their platform, especially here in the U.S. You know, you see a lot of big retailers, you know, kind of promoting their sustainability footprint and those kinds of things. And I imagine maybe for some of our audience, it's an area where they're very passionate about. I wonder if you have any experience, you know, in your space of retailers and how they're addressing this or how they're maybe, you know, leveraging the opportunity where, you know, if you're shipping closer to the customer, you're, the ship distance is shorter, maybe the environmental footprint is lower. Are retailers, you know, take kind of taking advantage of this from a sustainability perspective um, or what has been your experience there? Or is it just still too new that sustainability might come later? Um, the sustainability concern, it's well, very well illustrated with the food waste. So, um, because of these short times to deliver, um, when the customer is not at home and nobody can receive their products, they need to go back. And sometimes we have to try two to three times. So when we retry those periods of time or even rescheduling the orders, we need to change the product, uh, most with the fresh ones. Or... So um, this is something that uh, really concerns us. Uh, and this have evolved a lot and simply by communicating better with the customer or defining a very clear process on returns. Um, and even letting the customer know uh, that they should be at home and, and many other points. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is regarding packaging. Uh, in certain uh, states here in Brazil, we were not able to deliver uh, with plastic bags anymore. So we have to change to the way that we were delivering the packaging. Even um, we change the certain products, uh, certain uh, bags and, and packs because we wanted to remove plastics from the um, uh, from the bag. And this is something that uh, we really do. We don't we don't communicate much uh, because it's like still trying. It's a concern. Uh, it's not like in the US that you even offer uh, later deliveries in order to improve. And I think that um, many are doing here, but they are not appealing to the ESG or sustainability topic. It's just like more related to cost. It's, if you do this, it's cheaper. So, of course, uh, when the society here is ready to ask for this, retailers that are already thinking about that can communicate better and have a match. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. And as you were talking about food waste, we did have a, a previous live event together with Kellen, um, with Chris from the Food and Retail Operations Lab. So there are some videos also in your YouTube channel. And of course, everyone can access the MIT CDL Lab website. So you have the Food and Retail Operation, the Omni Channel, the Sustainability One. I invite everyone to use those resources to connect with our experts and also to get some information and articles there uh, that can help. Um, Maggie, in the interest of time, again, I need to wrap up this event, but it has been very insightful. We hope to have you back in the future. You have a lot of questions there, not only on the supply chain specifics, but also in the managerial insights. Some people is wondering how to get the buy-in. You talk a lot about the importance of people connected with the technology 
be ready to be prepared to know their clients. You also talked a lot about the customer centric approach. And I think that that was very interesting to the audience. So we will, of course, want to learn more about all that in the future. Um, so before we wrap it up, any final words to the audience? Thank you. Well, first of all, um, thanks for the questions. I will take some time to answer all of them. And it's very important to have, to know and to practice uh, supply chain management and understanding. But it's also important to learn about technology and connecting with people in retail. That the ones that started as brick and mortars. You may have leaders that they have been doing this for the last 30, 40 years. So being uh, empathetic, um, explaining, not in the hard way. You know, we love complexity. We love formulas, things that are very hard to understand. But communicating this in a simple way that can bring people near to you, that can make big transformation. And like being a translator for everyone that wants to know, to learn across the entire chain, it's also key. So you can have people working uh, with you, uh, for you, and they are inspired. They, they feel part of this. So that's why I really defend that knowledge, it's key. Uh, but the way that you communicate, it's also key for success. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That that was the perfect wrap up. And also thank you for being an inspirational woman in supply chain, because it's great to have some, some female power over there in, in the field. Uh, thank you, Kellen. As always, it's a pleasure to be a co-host with you. In this, and this one that is our last webinar in this season. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Lara. It was a pleasure co-hosting with you as well. Awesome. And to everyone, stay tuned to our social media for more events to come. And hopefully we will see you in our courses. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.